I'm going to try to offer under the watch of some very distinguished Japanese policymakers and economists in the audience some remarks about what Japan's experience tells us. And a lot of it confirms, in my view, the broad approach that Janet and Larry have overlappingly outlined and about the nature of the problem. But I do think it points to both a little bit more optimism and a little bit more radicalism than my colleagues have put out so far. Now, Japanification tends to get tossed around equivalent to secular stagnation. And of course, in this idea that the policy pedals to the floor, as Larry puts it, and you're not getting much out the other end, that seems right, combined with the very low nominal response to very aggressive monetary policy. But I think we do need to unpack this a bit and be a bit more careful. Um, there are not really two lost decades, um, as p people like me and many others keep pointing this out, but it never seems to enter people's heads. That from roughly 1990 to 92 until roughly 2002, there was a lost decade, and it was largely due to very insufficient monetary and fiscal re policy response to a huge financial shock. From roughly 2003 and the Koizumi regime forward, and certainly from to the end of 2012 and the Abe regime going forward, we have had actually a pretty good life in Japan. Per capita GDP growth is near the top of all rich countries. TFP growth, though lower than it's been, is, remains relatively high among G7 economies. There has been very long, stable expansions interrupted by the global financial crisis, which was not idiosyncratic to Japan. And importantly, these decades of very low interest rates and QE have not resulted in obvious bubbles or financial instability within Japan. This is one cannot make everything out of one example, but given the extremity of the Japanese case, it is worth at least noting that when we start thinking about the welfare effects of secular stagnation, that so long as you're not in the recession that Janet and Larry rightly worry about and the ability of policy to respond, then it's not so clear that having a nominal flatness is the worst thing in the world. Moreover, if you look at the response to the earthquake crisis in Japan in 2011, or the response to the global financial crisis in 2009, or what has taken place since, it seems, as my colleagues Olivia Blanchard and Takeshi Toshiro have argued, that you're able to pretty successfully use fiscal policy. And that's another point I want to raise, is that Janet and Larry both made reference to these deep structural factors, or as Janet, I think, aptly put it, chronic conditions associated with demography, with technological change. It is important to recognize that, for example, private consumption in Japan at the margin has varied quite a bit with fiscal policy, has been very responsive to fiscal policy. Work I did with Ken Kuttner showed that. More recent work by uh, Hausman and Wieland have shown that. Um, the real story is twofold in my mind about what is the mechanism of secular stagnation. First, that you are seeing a collapse of private investment and that no matter what you do on the investment side, nothing seems to revive it. And so if you look at Japan, in somewhat in support of Richard Koo and others' point about balance sheets, from 1998 up through roughly 2004, there's actually a private investment boom once the balance sheets have recovered and once the financial system is starting to get cleaned up. It is only roughly simultaneously with the developments in the US and Europe that private investment demand, corporate investment, goes down in Japan and stays down. And so that to me is also indicative that there may be some common technological or global factor at work. This isn't a Japan stopped investing privately much before the rest of the rich world did. <laughs> the other key shift, and again, none of this contradicts what Larry and Janet said, I think this just illustrates and maybe amplifies it a bit, is that there has been in Japan as elsewhere, 
essentially no response of wages to what would have been perceived as tight labor markets even in Japan. Blanchard and I argued shortly after Prime Minister Abe took office that some kind of wage coordination policy and upwards push on wages from the government would be useful, not pretending to take any credit for that. Prime Minister Abe and Governor Kuroda of the Bank of Japan did make public statements across a number of years trying to push up wages. And it proved to be exceedingly difficult, even with the Bank of Japan governor, even with the prime minister pushing. And in Japan, even as we've added a few million women to the workforce, which of course has disinflationary consequences in transition, you've, you do see a pattern that is similar to my mind to what we've seen in the US recently and what we've seen in Germany, that the elasticity of labor supply is much higher than anyone expected. This goes back to the Federal Reserve's forecasts about how we were not going to see participation come back up in the U.S. in, the, in this period, which Dan Bla Danny Blanchflower and I, among others, argued you would. You've got a issue there with labor. So to the degree anybody wants to write research papers, I'm less in a position than Larry to make suggestions, but I think teasing out some of these structural mechanisms about the low elasticity of investment response in the private sector and the very high elasticity of labor supply response are key. Turning now to policy, I think when we look back at, the, at, the, at Japan, as I've said, on the real side, policy has actually worked pretty much as expected from the textbooks. Fiscal policy and even monetary policy outside of the, once you go outside of corporate investment, which of course is a very big thing, but in terms of real estate, financing, we have seen responses of real estate investment structures, residential, to interest rate policy. Um, it's been pretty normal, but I think, and this, I, I, this is where I guess I think we need to be a bit more radical, in contrast to Ben Bernanke's presidential address yesterday, I don't think you can set aside how ineffective Japanese monetary policy has been in terms of nominal aggregates. I think you need to take very seriously and tr be troubled by this. If you think, some of you have heard me say this before, but if you think about the list, the wish list that Ben Bernanke or Paul Krugman or I put out for the Bank of Japan 15 years ago, they did it all. They announced a public inflation target. They made public commitments. They undertook QE on longer term bonds rather than shorter term bonds. They undertook QE on private sector assets. There was a sustained depreciation of the Japanese yen against the dollar on the order of 25%. There was, according to some people, an erosion of central bank independence, at least in perception. Certainly there was active coordination with expansionary fiscal policy by the Japanese government. You did all of this, and the inflation rate has thankfully gone above deflation, but has not risen, has not accelerated, has not stayed up. And so I think that when we get, this is where I sort of associate myself with Larry, I think we need to be a little cautious about assuming that in this environment, monetary policy should, is that helpful. Now, I don't want to run the experiment of what would have happened in Japan if the Bank of Japan had not done that. And as I said, I think the financial sector instability concerns, while real, at least in Japan, have proven themselves to be exaggerated. And so I would certainly support the Fed or other major central banks engaging in these kinds of policies, but I think it is wise to be cautious and assume that they are not assumed that they will be as effective as we think. So what is the operational advice for policies that I would suggest and I would give? Just checking time. Good. Um, I, I think that the first thing is to say that we got to get rid of this term unconventional policy for monetary policy. Uh, the, the statements calling what was done in 2008, 2009, 2010 unconventional I think is misleading. Acting on aggregates, acting on asset purchases and quantities rather than on prices, intervening in private markets, these were all things most central banks did throughout the 19th and most of the 20th century. It was a nicety 
that in the 70s, starting in the US and in the 80s and 90s and other major central banks, they decided, well, things have developed and we don't like distorting markets, therefore we can do everything on the short end of the yield curve. But it's not unconventional, and the vast majority of central banking history is to do these things. So let's leave that language behind. But even more, I think the, the fact is we need to think about different ways of doing fiscal monetary coordination. And I am actually quite a skeptic of a lot of complicated conditional arrangements that have been proposed about when you kick into you know, nominal GDP targeting or lower for longer or conditioning how you interact with the fiscal authority. I think the Bank of Japan has basically gotten it right. Yield curve control is a success story. Yield curve control says the Bank of Japan will target a given rate on the 10-year government bond and will do so until further notice. And they can set further notice in terms of macroeconomic aggregates or inflation target or whatever you choose. This to me has enormous advantages in that it is credible, it is achievable, it is transparent. It in no way gets the, while of course the central bank is therefore enabling fiscal policy, it is in no way having the central bank judge fiscal policy. It is not in any way conditional on the specific natures of the fiscal policy or the allocation of it. And for an independent central bank, it is always credible they can stop at any time. So I think rather than making things complex, we should all be thinking about yield curve controls the way forward. And if you think about the mid 20th century, for example, with the Treasury Fed Accord of the 30s, 40s, and early 50s, that's effectively what we did when we had large scale need for fiscal financing. The second thing I would say is I think we got to get away, and this is a place where I don't think Japan has done everything right, they were too much in the mainstream, the Bank of Japan, excuse me, is that we've got to get away from the sense of fragility that inflation, rapidly rising inflation expectations are around the corner. We had, including, again, I don't mean to pick on this, but he sets the standard, Ben Bernanke yesterday in his presidential address, talked about, again, the importance of anchoring inflation expectations. Turns out anchoring inflation expectations ain't that hard. If there's one thing Japan tells you, it's really hard to resurface expectations from the anchored position. And we're seeing this in Europe as well. Again, if we're talking about Zimbabwe, we're talking about Ecuador, it's a different matter. But for the major large economies, I am be much more concerned about our inability to get the anchor out of the silt at the bottom of the harbor. And that being the case, these finicking around with maybe inflation targets should be three, maybe they should temporarily be 3.2, I think is, is a mistake. I think if you're going to signal and if we're going to do all this language as Krugman coined many years ago about responsible irresponsibility, actually move the inflation target. Now again, this is to some degree completely unrealistic, but somebody needs to say this occasionally. Moreover, I think it would be best to think about a G7 agreement to raise inflation targets simultaneously. That would be more credible, that would minimize the capital flow and exchange effects, and it is something that central banks could easily do together. They would need, of course, to have governmental approval. Now, going down this road, the euro area has two major problems with the two things I've said. First, on the inflation target, of course, they have their Maastricht uh, constitutional definition of inflation at 2%. As Larry said, I think the numbers that were set in, in 1992 in the process enabled in 1999 need to be reconsidered. When Bernanke, Laubach, Michigan, and I wrote the inflation targeting book, one of the biggest things I think we got wrong was we, and I, this is just speaking for myself obviously, um, was that we put in a lot of room in the book for the idea that inflation targets should change over time due to long-term trends and processes to do that. But of course exchange rate targets have become like exchange rate targets. No central bank wants to be the one that is weak, the first to move, the first to say it should go up. And there is a great deal of peer pressure to keep the inflation target at one number. So therefore, if we're going to raise it, best to raise it as a group. I think public investment, I just completely agree with Larry and Janet. I would just add a couple things based on Japan. Um, the first is remember, and this again goes to work I and others did, the first lost decade in Japan, or the lost decade 
of the 90s in Japan, since it wasn't two decades, was in part because public investment was killed. If you unpack all these supposed fiscal packages of, that were touted in Japan in the 90s, most of the public investment was trivial or negative. And we've seen a version of this, of course, in Europe under austerity that what gets, tends to get cut first is public investment rather than public consumption or other transfers. So while I completely accept and back what my distinguished colleagues have said about balanced budget funding and PAYGO Social Security and productivity improving public investment, obviously they're right. I would additionally point out that we need to push back against the idea that Japan's been doing public investment and it's failed and it's backfired. That's not true. Japan only started really doing public investment in the last few years, and if there is a critique to be done of Abenomics, it certainly is that the quality of public investment hasn't been great. So even if we agree that public investment is good, there's certainly room to think about the quality and what's the process for doing that, and perhaps that's where the Green New Deal or whatever label we're going to put on it gives us some hope that it would be, on average, higher quality investment. Um, finally, going back to the European Union, uh, excuse me, the Euro area, and then finally with the U.S. The other problem, of course, for the Euro area as opposed to Japan or the U.K. now no longer part of Europe, or uh, the U.S. is that there is no one safe asset. And my colleague, Jeremy Zettelmeyer, as well as Philip Lane at the ECB and Marcus Brunemeyer at Princeton are all very aware of this and have done really important work on this. But I think the secular stagnation issue and how you move forward from it makes it even more important, is one more argument why Europe needs to synthesize something that could be used in a yield curve control type of environment, because they can't do it right now. But finally, turning to the U.S. and to the macro Pru side, I want to very strongly echo Janet and Ben Bernanke's written about this, many of us have, um, but it's obviously incredibly important for her to say it, that the U.S. has a very narrow macro prudential toolkit right now. And we have a process, given what has been done to the FSOC and with the FSOC in the first place, as opposed to the central bank controlling things, that is militating against good activist use of this tool, um, even leaving aside whatever the preferences are of the current leadership of the Fed. That's, that's, a, that's a separate issue. Um, I think this is another place where the profession advising policymakers has to think more creatively. I, I have advocated, and I would suggest two areas where Japan and Europe have done some things and the U.S. has not. The first is, as was mentioned by Larry with respect to Google, but is more general, we are seeing the massive accumulation of cash hoards on the balance sheets of corporations. And the fact is, 40 years ago, or excuse me, yeah, almost 40 years ago, we had the whole Jensen and Meckling literature, and it was seen as a policy goal to change corporate governance and finance practices so that management could not sit on free cash bottled up in companies. And we correctly criticized Germany and Japan for having Stillis Reserve and Hidden Reserve bottled up in their companies that were bad for productivity and corporate management. I think it is worth us go returning to this issue of why and how we get all this money pot up and bottled up in the corporate sector and whether that serves public interest, because clearly there are laws that set to encourage or discourage how much of that you do. Second and finally, I think the way forward as part of the uh, automatic stabilizers discussion, and Karen Dynan organized an excellent session, I think yesterday, um, here at AEA on that. Um, I think a way forward is we need to be thinking aggressively about symmetric real estate taxes that move both ways at some national level. And Europe in various sta member states is starting to look at that. Japan is looking at it a little. In the U.S., there is the prospect that just as there are constitutional arguments against the wealth tax per se, that this might be something that cannot be done directly at the federal level, even though, of course, it would only make sense at a federal level. So that's something to wrestle with. But I do think, given the enormous role of real estate in asset booms and busts and in the largest swings in, in GDP, the macro crew has to move in that direction. Thank you very much.